Published in 1960, Ring of Bright Water by Gavin Maxwell is arguably the finest book ever written about a man's relationship with landscape and wildlife. It tells the story of the author's life with his pet otters in the remote West Highlands of Scotland. This much is known, but what has not been told before is the account of one of the otter boys who lived with Maxwell. Now, 40 years after Gavin Maxwell's death, Terry Nutkins tells his own remarkable story. Beneath this stone, the site of Camusfena, are buried the ashes of Gavin Maxwell. Born 15th of July 1914, died 7th of September 1969. Well, yes, Gavin is under this lone rock in a large field, on what was the site of the house where Gavin wrote Ring of Bright Water, the house where I spent much of my childhood. I'm probably best known for my TV shows like Animal Magic and The Really Wild Show. But my love of animals began when I was a child. And that's what brought me here to the remote Western Highlands. And this is where I lived with Gavin Maxwell and his otters. I was born in a terraced house in the middle of London. And one day, instead of turning left and going to this dreadful Victorian school, I turned right and walked across a vast expanse of grass called Regent's Park and found a fence and climbed over it and landed up in the elephant paddock at London Zoo. And I just adored those elephants so much so that at the end of the day when I got home I never washed my hands because I just loved to go to sleep smelling the elephants on my hands. That in the end turned out to be, well, what can I say? An obsession, really, because every day I went to London Zoo. I befriended the keepers, I got to know all the animals, and I just loved it. It was the end of my school days. And then one lucky day, my parents received a letter from London Zoo, from a lady called Caroline, asking if I would like to go to Scotland to spend my summer holidays with a man called Gavin Maxwell and look after one of his otters. Well. They said, yes, you can go, and off I went. For me, this was out of a concrete jungle, really, into the wilderness. It was so different from anything that I'd ever, ever been used to. I was 13 years old, and it was really quite an incredible sort of transformation, really, from terraced houses to mountains, to huge, great mountains, some 3,000 feet high, in this complete wilderness here at Camusfena. Recently I went to Suffolk to meet the lady who actually arranged for me to be here and live here with Gavin Maxwell. This is just a superb old English house. Hello. How are you? All these black and white uh, photographs. Yeah, they're back. so good. Look, there's a there's the zoo, Morton and Chi Chi. That was my very first job at the zoo was um, filing the bamboo for Chi Chi. Right now, can we get one thing clear now? You were Caroline Jarvis then. What is your name now? My name now is Caroline Cranbrook because I married Earl of Cranbrook, Gaythorn Cranbrook. Um, and my name was changed several times because he, when I first married him, he was Lord Medway, and then when his father died, he became Lord Cranbrook. I'd like to, if you don't mind, Caroline, just go back to 1959, and back to what I think you referred to on a, on, on the Desert Island Disc program you were on as a, a, the, the family at London Zoo. Absolutely. I w well, when I left Cambridge, I didn't really know what to do as a career, and my own family knew Solly Zuckerman, who was secretary of the zoo at the time, and he said, look, I want to start a club for children at the zoo, but you can't do that unless you can type, and so you must go away and learn to type, which I did. Mm. And I then started the XYZ Club, which was the Exceptional Young Zoologist, and this was both for schools and also for individual members, children. And you were one of the founder members of that. We, it was extremely successful. We had about 5,000 members, I think. So, 
how did it come about that Gavin, did Gavin write to you? No, it was a complete sort of coincidence. I remember very well, I was just crossing the road and somebody called Peter Crowcroft, who was a very well-known naturalist, came up to me and said, um, I have a friend who is a very famous writer and naturalist, Gavin Maxwell, who is looking for a boy to look after his otters during the summer because his otter keeper, his otter boy, is going on holiday and he needs somebody to take his place. Do you know anybody in your children's club? And so I said, well, I'll have a think about that. And I tried to find out a little bit more about Gavin. I didn't know him at all. And I did ask at least three people, including the scientific director of the zoo, about Gavin. And one of the things I did ask him was whether he was homosexual. And the answer... Oh, you did ask him? Yes, that? I did, yes. Okay. I was not that naive, even though I was <laughs> had led a sheltered life. And the answer was, oh, no, no, no. How do you feel about that now that we, he obviously was? Well, I, I've, now I feel guilty, really, in a way. I then remember talking to your mother and... Now, that, the, now that's interesting. How, how was my mother about all this? She was, seemed very happy about it. Did yes, she? yes. I, mean, I, she, I think she came to the zoo and I interviewed her with you and said it would be all expenses paid and it would be very interesting and a very lovely place and the idea was you would go for whatever it was a month or six weeks and come back again and so, so it was all agreed. And off I went. And off you went and you never came back, did you? <laughs> Gavin Maxwell was born in the lowlands of Scotland near Monreith and came from an aristocratic family. His grandfather was the Duke of Northumberland and there were many other links to aristocratic and even royal blood. His father sadly died when he was just three months old, killed in the First World War. And his mother never really recovered. She put all her love and affection into Gavin, even sleeping in the same room as him until he was eight years old. He really did have an odd childhood, lonely, remote and wild, but he did become an excellent marksman. Shooting game was a childhood passion which stayed with him throughout his life. He was sent away to boarding school and after school went on to Oxford University. He graduated in 1937 and just two years later the war began. He spent most of his war years working for the Special Operations Executive. He was a field craft and weapons instructor at Arisaig on the Noida Peninsula. Shortly after the war, he started a shark fishing venture on the tiny island of Soy off Skye. And one of his first books, Harpoon Adventure, was about his ultimately disastrous time there. Gavin might best be known for Ring of Bright Water, a book about his life with otters and wildlife, but he really was so many other things as well. A portrait painter, a hugely successful travel writer, and I knew him as an eccentric and highly complex man. So I went off. Mm. When did you then meet Gavin? I mean, he corresponded with me, and I think he then asked me to stay up there. And he, he became a very good friend, and whenever he came to London, which was once every sort of few months, he'd ring me up and say, would I like to come and have dinner with him? And like a fool, I always used to go along expecting to get dinner, and we'd sit there for half the night while he drank a bottle of whiskey, and um, he, he was a bit telling me all his troubles and he was a man of great charm but he was also extremely demanding mm. and he's very emotionally demanding I think he was always always wanting you to do things for him and I think a lot of people did end up doing things for him because because of this great charm because he all he always seemed very desperate really and not quite feeling sorry for him but you felt you had to help some of it was practical, some of it was emotional, and they just went on and on and on, the conversation. Would you have said Gavin was a lonely man? I think he was. I think he had great difficulty in communicating with people, and I think this is why he, his emotions um, were only... He was only able to release his emotions, I think, with animals, and also with, with children and um, young boys. He, he felt at ease with these people, um, young people. Yeah, the same way as he did with animals. Wow, look at those ones. Sandeg 1961, with sunglasses on, which was unheard of for Sandeg. And these clothes that Gavin had sent up from Carnaby Street. Really? Yeah. 
this shirts and, and jackets and he, he felt he said you must have good clothes and i want you in this that and the other and they were sent up especially from carnaby street and i've, I've worn check shirts ever since 28th of june 1960 dear napkins miss jarvis has written to me that you would like to come up here during the holidays and help us out with the otters etc i am glad you want to come and hope you'll enjoy yourself she tells me that she has explained the kind of life it is, so I won't repeat it all again, except to say that it's pretty primitive and rather like being on an expedition. In fact, about as different from being in London as it could be. Now, the journey up. You catch a train at Euston at 7pm in the evening to Inverness. You'll have a sleeper and there'll be a dining car on the train. I could meet you there, but it's nearly 90 miles away. And if you feel able to come on by the connection to Kyle of La Carche, 35 miles from here, it would be very much easier. Clothes. To start with, they can't be too old. Two pairs of blue jeans and or shorts. You may find shorts more useful as the bottoms of trousers are always getting wet. Two pairs gym shoes. Gum boots, if you have them. Jerseys, shirts, socks, pyjamas, if you wear them. And will you let me know your height and your size in shoes? And if there's anything else I think you need, I'll get it up here. Best wishes, Gavin Maxwell. I always remember that day going off on the train. It was very exciting, it was very different, and it was also a little bit frightening as well, because I'd never really been out of London. I got to Inverness, I then got onto another train to Kyle Coles, and that's where Gavin Maxwell met me. He said, hello, Nutkins. He didn't call me by my Christian name, and I thought, well, you're actually quite a rude man, really. Anyway, I said hello, I think I even called him Sir at the time. And I jumped into the Land Rover and off we went to Sandeg. It's a, some 30 mile drive from Carnival House and we parked the car and we then walked down to Lower Sandeg, Lower Camus Fierna, which is about a mile and a half walk, carrying my own luggage. Gavin never offered to carry my luggage at all and I think he even asked me to carry some stuff for him. So my growing up started very, very young and very, very quickly. I always remember this slog of a walk because, again, you know, the hardest walk I'd ever done in my life was over flat grass in Regent's Park. This was so different. This was over moorland. It was up and down and up and down until we reached the, the top of a hill. And then all of a sudden there's the Atlantic Ocean surrounding this beautiful white cottage absolutely stunningly beautiful with a ring of bright water going round it the river running round the house and then flowing out into the open atlantic ocean we went down the hill crossed the burn crossed a wooden bridge and there opened the door to camry's fierna house This is where Sandeg House was before it burned down. It was a traditional one and a half story house, I suppose. And I'm standing now where the front door used to be. So if I pretend that the house is still here in one piece, I'm now entering the house. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a lovely warm atmosphere in this house because it's all pine panelled, pitch pine panelled. And if I look to my right, I can see a door. And if I open that door, there is a desk right in front of me. And that's where Gavin Maxwell used to sit and write his books. And in particular, Ring of Bright Water. Over to the left in the far corner was his bed, because this is where he spent most of his time writing from the early hours of the morning till late at night. Every day I used to come in here with a great mug of tea for him and wake him up. The first thing he would do is light a cigarette and he would get out of bed drink his tea, get to his desk and start writing. I was astonished by the chaos because there is nothing chaotic about his writing at all. It's very clean, it's very pure, it's very well uh, structured and organised. So John Lister Kay, who knew Maxwell in his later years. And the impression that he gave in the ring, Rocks Remain, Raven Seek Thy Brother, was 
of someone who had a very purposeful life and therefore there was an implied structure to it. When you arrived at Sandeg, there was bedlam going on. <laughs> and, you know, there was no set meal times, nobody seemed to know who was coming, who was going, no one seemed to know who was looking after this altar or that altar. I mean, it was just, it was just bedlam. But it was a wonderfully warm welcome. And I remember sleeping with a polar bear skin on my bed. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought this was very special, I really did. <laughs> So there we are, that's Gavin's bedroom there on the right-hand side where he wrote all the books. And if I look straight ahead of me, there's a staircase, and I'm walking up the staircase now, and when I just reach in now to the top of it, it's like a landing with a window, with a, like a Velux window. And it's only about six foot wide, but that was my bed. It was called The Perch, and that was the first bed that I had here in Sandeg House. It was quite a nice bed bed to be in actually because it was sort of isolated and remote and yes indeed I felt like I was sort of perching up there I felt actually quite secure up there because you know if anyone was coming up the stairs I could I could see they were coming up the stairs so it was really good there weren't any doors that could sort of open quietly if I go across to the left hand side of the perch uh, there was another room and that was the room that Edel the otter had as her bedroom. She had a great big bedroom and Jimmy shared that bedroom with her. It was a quite a strange way of life really in this house. I had to take my otter, Teco, out for his regular walk. I had to first of all check him in the morning to make sure he was okay, give him some meals to eat, that was his favourite food, and Jimmy did the same with Edel, the otter. We would all have breakfast together and then, of course, we all went off and did our thing. Gavin went into his study, into his bedroom office, and started writing, and I went off with Teco for a walk over to the islands. A walk with a difference, really, because it's not easy to say to an otter when a force-eight wind is blowing and it's raining, I want to go home. There's no such thing. The otter comes out of the ocean when it wants to come out of the ocean. And sometimes I'd be out there for three, four, five hours waiting for Teco, to decide that, you know, he'd, he'd had enough swimming and wanted to come and get back to his little shed, which is where he lived, at, just outside the house, and roll himself in blankets and get nice and dry and go to sleep. Ring of Bright Water was dedicated to John Donald and Mary MacLeod, and they lived at Upper Sandake, and they were very, very close friends of Gavin's. Mary had some sons, and one of them, Willie, is actually meeting me here today. Hi, Willie. You all right? Hi, Grant from Wayne. Yeah. Now, you used to go down to Sandeg a long time before Ring of Bright Water was oh, didn't you? Yes. I think Gavin arrived here in 1949. I would be 10 years old then. And you were 10 years old? Yeah. So we're, we're on the other side of the burn, the Sandeg burn. And to my left here used to be the orchard. Oh, and garden. And the garden. Um, yeah. And we had the plum the plum trees. Plum trees yeah. And apple trees. Too, what memories do you have of the sea here? Uh, is there any in particular that you've got? Yeah, one, one that sticks in my mind was that lovely sun, sunny, sunny day. And all of a sudden there was a flurry in the water. And who comes streaking up at Mitchellville? And run up the oar, run up my arm, uh, onto my shoulder, wrap himself around my shoulder. and tripped me away in my ear. Mitchville the Otter? Mitchville the Otter. Now you're one of yes. the very few yes. people yes. that actually met yes. Mitchville the Otter. Oh yes, I used to play with my lot. Gavin had said that be careful with otters if they do attack they'll go for the genitals. And all I had on was a tiny wee pair of swimming track. Uh -huh. <laughs> and my legs crossed and I was shouting, Major! Major! <laughs> Mitchville way back down the old end and in the water, quite fantastic to watch. Yes. Uh, so quick and agile yeah. in the water, like yeah. turning over and uh, right over like that, and back up, back up the oar, back round my shoulder too. Mitch was quite a big otter, wasn't uh, he? He was, yeah, a lovely otter, quite yeah, and he's quite big too, yeah. yeah. I never yeah. met him, I'd yeah. love to have yeah. met Mitch. And can I see a seal there? Yeah. I can. Yeah. Oh, that's an otter. No, no. It's an otter. Well, it's unbelievable! Yeah. We've got an otter in the bay come to yeah. see us. Well, well, well. And, oh, what? That is unbelievable. Look at it. Look at it. Yeah. Willie, what's yeah. going on? I know. Wow. 
Well, well, I've been many times here, in this bay and I've never seen an otter in the bay. I mean, and tremendous swimming in that surf yeah, there like that. No. But what a fantastic thing to happen. Wow. Let's walk down closer because you, as you know, they don't have actually terribly good eyesight. Okay. Yeah, so you can get very close to them. Okay. He would have, would have gone round there. He's probably around that corner there, you know. Oh no, there he is. Over to the right there, just fishing. He'd come up to the surface any moment now. Just in line with my hand. Oh, nice. uh -huh. Because you've got these rollers coming in with the white tops, you can only see them right up there. It's very easy to see them on a on a calm, flat day, but for us to see this otter at this very moment oh, of us coming down yeah. to Ring of Bright Water to Sand Egg, oh. yeah. Wow. <laughs> Well, that was really great to see Willie, and what a delight to be able to see a wild otter at Sand Egg, at Camus Fena, and, and with Willie. And especially after we were talking about Mitch Bill, which was Gavin's first otter, which he brought back from Iraq. Talking about Midge, well, Midge, as we all know, in Ring of Bright Water, was killed by the roadmender. The rumor was that it was a man called Big John, who I actually knew uh, until the day he died, and I never ever discussed with him whether or not he was the man that actually killed Midspill from Ring of Bright Water. But everyone always said, and including Gavin, that it was Big John that killed Midge. Well, I happen to know Donnie, and Donnie is uh, Big John's son, and he's agreed to have a chat with me about his father, and that's where I'm going now to see Donnie. I'm on my way to see Donnie now, and he actually works on the Kyle Ray Ferry. Hi, Donnie. You look a busy man today. We are, yes. Today's good. Right. Donnie, I've known you for many years. Yeah. Your father for many more years. But one thing that I never did ask Big John, as mm -hmm. it was known, was did he kill Mids the Otter from Ring of Bright Water? And I just wondered whether he discussed that with you at any time. He discussed it, yes. He never did it. How did he deal with that, with, with people thinking that he did do it? Well, he went through a, a pretty hard time in his life in the Second World War, so I don't think small things like that would have worried him too much. Didn't bother him at all? Didn't bother him. No, he didn't do it, and that was it. I wonder where that rumour came from. I have no idea. Because it was never written in the book, was it? No, it was never in the book, no. I don't know. It, it never ever said Big John from Glen <laughs> No, no, they never said that. Because we, we used to get in school, we used to get some stick in school about it. Did you? Oh yeah, when I was young, yeah. Yeah. When we were in primary school. But, and when we left, when I, when I left school and got a bit older, I, I asked him a few times and he always... And he said, I don't know what you're both, talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> when, he was, when he was both drunk and sober, yeah. I asked him. And did, you, you met Maxwell, didn't you? One yes. Time, you know? Oh, I met him a few, a few times, times with my father. And yeah. that's an interesting point you've just said. You met him with your father mm -hmm. because he was friends of your father. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, he was good friends. Yeah. He, used to stop, he used to stop and speak to my, to my dad on the road many times. And they never, they never discussed the, and, and anything but dead authors. Oh, yeah. So we can clear this matter up once and for all. Yeah. Big John of Glen Elk had nothing to do with Mitch dying. Well, I, that's what he said to me, and I, I, I don't think he, had, he had, hadn't got it in him to, to kill anything but my father. Gavin's relationship with the otters that replaced Midge, Edel and Teco was very strange really in that he was childlike with them. This whole different man would come out, this complete child. It was, it was almost cringing for me to watch it because he would sing them songs like lovely dog, lovely dog. His whole voice, his whole attitude would change and he would caress them and be close to them and it was something that I didn't find attractive for some reason and I searched my thoughts about that and have done for for many years but I didn't find it attractive that, that he actually treated them like children in that way the times that I got to know Gavin very well were the times when I was alone with him at Camusina and at that time was when Jimmy Watt, the other otter keeper, went away on holiday. And sometimes on these 
dark winter nights when you had this really strong wind blowing outside and the hiss of the tilly lamps because they did they just had this dull light this glow and they all the time and the howling of the wind outside it was i suppose very romantic in its way gavin drank a substantial amount of whiskey he enjoyed whiskey and there's nothing wrong with that but he drank a lot of it and and he did ramble on somewhat and he told the most wonderful stories sometimes but some days the evenings were very very long because he was in a quite a depressed state of mind and would be a very difficult man to be with there was a stress there was a strain there and i also i, I sort of felt there was something he really wanted to talk about but it was deeper than that the thoughts in his head were very very personal and it was almost like he was having an, an, an inner battle that wasn't easy i don't think for a young boy whoever it might be those dark days weren't good and i had a little place over on the island which i used to go to when i felt i needed to be on my own and and, and sort of take stock really of of my life and it was like a little hillock and it had a little curve in it and I, I'd, I'd sit there looking over the sound of sleep and I often looked at some of the big ships going by and there was one in particular and it was the McBrain steamer that went by every day of the week I used to sit there and look at the ship going by and see the lights on it and I used to think to myself there's all people on that boat and they're all together and they're all laughing and joking and, and really having quite a nice time I guess I felt pretty lonely really but having said all that I really love Sandeg I initially came up to Sandeg for really just six weeks six weeks of, of summer holidays but I thought I don't want to go back to London and I said to Gavin is there any chance I could stay he then said yes you you can stay but the only way that the authorities in, in London will allow you to stay here is, is if I become your legal guardian. He then contacted my father. And my father initially, sort of, if you want, so I've, I've heard from my mother, checked out if Gavin was a suitable person for his son to stay with. And my father felt happy that he was. And so he did sign, a, sign me away, so to speak. My parents signed me away and Gavin then became my legal guardian and had complete and absolute control over me. That didn't affect my life initially, but it did later on. But that's another story. And in the next program, I'll tell that story. It's about how my relationship with Gavin Maxwell started to decline. And also about the saga of Ring of Bright Water, how it started to disintegrate. The next part of Terry Nupkin's story will be broadcast at the same time next week.